It's funny how certain creatures don't get on. Cats and dogs, foxes and chickens. But sometimes, against all odds, enemies can become friends. And this story is about such an odd little friendship. In a busy little town, not very far away, there was a church. And in the church lived a mouse whose name was Arthur. Arthur liked living in a church. For one thing, he was very fond of music, particularly if it was loud. Also, if the verger had filled the font, he could go and mess about in his boat or practice the crawl if the weather was warm enough. There were many advantages to living the luxurious life of a church mouse, but Arthur liked it best because it was safe. Uh, and he did have a rather special companion. Samson, the church cat, had listened to so many sermons about the meek being blessed and everybody really being brothers that he'd grown quite frighteningly meek and treated Arthur just like a brother. But sometimes Arthur got a bit depressed. One reason for this was his diet. All he ever had to eat were the sweets the boys dropped during choir practice. You might say that it wouldn't make you depressed, but you're not a mouse. It made Arthur fat and bilious, and it didn't do his teeth any good either. But worst of all, he was lonely, for in the whole of that church, there was not one other mouse. And when he felt like having a chat, Samson always seemed to be having one of his day-long naps. Then one afternoon, when Arthur was reading, an idea popped into his head. And after checking it with the parson, he rushed out of the church and into the town to put his idea into practice. He almost gave up his idea, but then he thought, hmm, if it's always as nasty as this, everybody's bound to agree to my plan. So he hurried on and only paused once all the rest of the way. He went into the first likely-looking house he came to, knocked at the mouse hole, and introduced himself to the mouse who answered. Straight away, she asked him in to meet her husband, for she knew that anybody who lived in a church must be a pretty decent sort of person. Over tea, they chatted about life and things, but Arthur could see that his new companions were a bit down in the dumps. After tea, they took Arthur on a tour of the premises. Look at that thing, they grumbled. People leave them lying about, and they can be dangerous. And stop that this minute! The mouse mother suddenly shouted. You could be electrocuted. Furthermore, the house cat had not heard of brotherly love. They had to flee for their lives back to the hole. We just don't know what things are coming to, they said to Arthur. But when he explained his idea to them, they were overjoyed. We'll invite everyone round this evening to hear about it, they exclaimed. So, that evening, when everyone had assembled and stopped shuffling and coughing, Arthur stood up, cleared his throat and began without any beating around the bush. My idea is this. You all come and live at the church. It's warm, quiet, and I've got Samson the church cat right under my thumb. Uh, almost. The parson says if we do a few odd jobs, we'll be paid in cheese, best quality. He's expecting us tomorrow morning if you want to come. Everybody thought the idea simply splendid. Next morning, all the mice followed Arthur to their new home. One or two things took some getting used to. But on the whole, everything went very well. The mice kept their half of the bargain and worked quite hard every day. They made sure that the flowers were always fresh and artistically arranged. They polished the congregation's shoes while they listened to the sermon. If there was a wedding, then they all went outside to pick up the confetti and rice, which they made into a big rice pudding for supper. As for polishing the brasses, well, everybody loved that, because they could sneak glances at their reflections without appearing to be vain. The parson kept his half of the bargain, too. Each Friday, he put the different kinds of cheese in the vestry. Every evening after supper, the grown-ups sat round the vestry stove and took turns frightening each other with horrible stories about dogs. They meant cats, really, but they, they always said dogs so as not to hurt Samson's feelings. Samson himself did babysitting, and they didn't mind a bit about hurting his feelings or any other part of him, for that matter. But 
one Sunday, during the harvest festival service, a terrible thing happened. Samson, who'd suffered a very bad night with the young mice, dropped off during the sermon and dreamt he was back in the days before he was reformed. When he woke up, he found he was not dreaming. He was chasing mice all over the church. Remember about brotherly love, and by that time it was too late. All the people had started to walk angrily out of the church. One of them said, Either get rid of those vermin, all the mice had gasped, for no one had ever called them that before, at least not to their faces, or we'll never come back. And what's more, they'd better not try coming back to their old holes because they'll be blocked up and there'll be a real cat waiting for them. Here, Samson gasped. When the church was empty, Everybody turned on him. I'd heard the sermon before, Samson mumbled, trying to apologize for sleeping through it. It was no good. They would have to go in the morning, because the church had to have a congregation. That night, the mice sat around the vestry stove with their backs turned on Samson and Arthur. But meanwhile, something very, very fishy was going on. <laughs> taking the candlesticks off the altar. They knew he must be a terrible chap because he hadn't bothered to take his hat off in church. He's stealing them, the mice whispered to each other. But the schoolmaster said in a quaking voice that a man wasn't guilty until proved innocent and hadn't they better go back to the vestry and think about it calmly because desertion was the better part of valor. But Arthur and Samson knew they must do something even though they'd all been sacked. Arthur stepped forward with a fairly resolute expression on his face. Uh, follow me and, and be very, 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 Samson gave him a push, very, um, uh, quiet, he whispered. Fortunately, the burglar was wasting time, gloating over the candlesticks. Everybody tiptoed closer and Arthur tied the burglar's bootlaces together. He had to do it because Samson could only tie granny knots. Then Samson obliged with his party piece. It was supposed to be the song of the nightingale, but everybody else thought it sounded like a policeman's whistle. They counted on the burglar, thinking so too. He did. In his haste to escape the police, or as Samson insisted later to get outside to see the nightingale, he dropped his sack, spun around, and took a great stride, or, or rather he would have done if his bootlaces hadn't been tied together. It worried them a bit when he landed on his head because they thought he might have broken some of the tiles the parson was so proud of. It turned out there were just a few cracks. As for the burglar himself, he appeared to be sleeping like a baby. Everybody had the idea of rolling him up in the carpet. At any rate, everybody said it was his idea afterwards. They all put their shoulders to the carpet and pushed. Suddenly, the burglar woke up and started shouting words that even the schoolmaster had never heard before. Then he began to struggle, and the mice had to strain to stop him unrolling himself. Do something, they shouted at Arthur. Uh, um, ah, oh, said Arthur decisively. There's only one thing to do, he cried. We, we must ring the bells and summon help. Half of you follow me to the bell tower. And with that, he dashed off like a born leader, except that he went in the wrong direction. And by the time he'd realized his mistake, the others were halfway there, so he had to pretend he'd stayed in the rear to hurry the stragglers along. When he caught up, he found everybody staring in dismay at the bell ropes, which were tied up well out of reach. Now what? they all cried. Um, um, the uh, art, said Arthur without hesitation. The schoolmouse said that Samson could climb on the back of a chair and reach one of the ropes. But Samson hadn't forgotten the nasty names the schoolmouse had called him in the vestry. Wolves in spotted sheep's feathers aren't very good at climbing on the back of chairs, he mumbled sarcastically, whilst reaching for the bell rope. But it was no good. Then a mouse who lived in the local theatre made a shy suggestion. I don't know whether it can be done without sky blue ties with sequins on them, he added, but, but we could try. So they did, and it worked. 
and they rang the bells until they thought everyone within a radius of 10 miles must be awake. The townsfolk tumbled out of bed, shouting things like, Earthquake! Martians! Flood! Plague! Escape! Rhinoceros! Anarchists! Apaches! Fire! The end of the world! Locusts! Burst pipe! Students! Mad hedgehog! Icebergs! But soon, everybody was racing towards the church. When they saw how near they'd come to losing their beautiful candlesticks, the townsfolk got very peevish with the burglar. They seemed to think that he'd got himself rolled up in the carpet through trying to steal that too. But Arthur soon told them how he, well, to stretch a point, he and his friends and Samson had trapped the burglar. And after that, of course, there was no more talk of their having to leave the church. The schoolmouse let it be known that he was quite prepared to take the more advanced Sunday school classes in philosophy, horticulture and train spotting, but everybody just sighed. As for Samson, you might think he was very sorry about his lapse, but you'd be wrong, because he wasn't. The mice had been taking him for granted of late, he thought, and the fact that they were frivolous, giddy creatures was no excuse. They'd learned he was not to be trifled with, and after that, Whenever they needed reminding, he would just yawn and say he hoped he wouldn't drop off during the sermon. And then there would be no more giggling and tittering over silly jokes about dogs for at least two days. Goodbye.